All right, we're at six o'clock, so how about we kick off? Uh, everybody, welcome. A huge thank you to the Californians for getting up uh, at the, in the, literally in the middle of the night to join us this evening. Um, I, just a quick introduction to Austin uh, before we get going. It was really interesting when I was doing my homework, getting ready for tonight, um, seeing the, the word waitlist at the top of the wine, the winery website. Um, there's not a lot of wineries around the world that uh, don't even let you get you get a taste of the wine or, or, or actually buy the wines or join the database. And Ovid is one of those. So I have to thank you for the access that uh, both Caleb and Austin and Vivian have given us on the database to taste these tonight. I think one of the biggest, uh, the glowing kind of uh, attribute, um, accolades that was, has been given to of it is uh, the quote by Galoni saying it's one of the most exciting new Napa Valley Cabernets to enter the game in many a year. Um, and it certainly is judging, certainly from my salesman point of view, extraordinary to see the kind of ratings that Austin does not just once, but every single year. It really is something to be immensely proud of, um, I'm, I'm sure. And so thanks again for allowing us to do this tonight. So I'm going to hand you over to Austin just to give us some background to the winery and then we'll taste the wine. Sounds good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Pleased to, pleased to meet you virtually. Um, I thought, well, if I can figure this out and uh, just bear with me, I've not done, um, oh, well, I guess I can't share any slides or any pictures. Um, but uh, for those of you who are not really familiar with us or kind of learning about us really for the first time, uh, we sit roughly um, in the middle of Napa Valley on the east side at the top of the hills. So we sit about uh, 1,200 feet above the valley floor um, on an area that's known as Pritchard Hill. And it's really this rock plateau that was formed by uh, over, well, eons, but uh, really through a giant landslide um, eons and eons ago. And so the top of where we sit sloughed off down into the, the valley floor and it formed what is now Dolla Valley and Screaming Eagle and um, Rudd Estate and uh, a number of others. Uh, and it left us with this really rocky, just basically a rock bench um, that over the eons is degraded into about three feet of extremely, extremely rocky, uh, iron rich, um, bright red soil. And it's a really cool spot uh, to, to be. And so where we began or how we began um, was really with our found, the founding partners back in 1998. They bought a, a, a chunk of land up here um, that was originally 300 acres. Uh, forgive me, I can't convert that into hectares at, at this early hour in the morning. Um, but uh, in any case, it was a big, a big piece of land, and they they had no, they loved being in Napa, but they had no intention of actually being in the wine business. And they quickly realized that their favorite wines, which was Maya from Dalval and Bryant, uh, were coming from right, you know, adjacent to the property. And so they thought, well, geez, if we've got some good dirt, let's let's you know, let's maybe have a few people up and just take a look at this. Uh, and so they had. Um, a number of folks up, one of which was David Abreu, uh, a renowned farmer and viticulturist in, in Napa. Uh, and he was like a little kid. He's like, oh my God, this is, this is like the last best place in Napa that's not been developed. You gotta do this. Um, and so they thought, well, you know, if we could do something really spectacular, then okay, let, let's do that. And so um, they mapped out about 15 acres of vineyard uh, to develop. And we developed that uh, during in 99. I spent the whole year developing the, you know, prepping the land, um, and we pulled out about fifty thousand cubic yards of rock uh, out of out of the fifteen acres. So, um, anyone that wants any rock, let me know. I'm I'm your guy. Um, shipping's on you, uh, but uh, help yourself. Um, I know people who buy that. <laughs> <laughs> I, one can only hope, man. We have all right now to do it. Um, yeah. And so, planted our vineyard in, in 2000, and, um, and one of the things that's really core to us, and one of the things that's really, um, that drives us is, is this curiosity and constant experimentation. So the way that we planted the vineyard is 15 acres, 17 different blocks, um, and each block is a different clone and restock combination. 
so we really planted it as an experiment to see what was going to work um, across the really kind of across the the uh, area the two blocks that we planted or two larger blocks that we planted um, and so uh, that was two thousand and then as we were growing the grapes we thought oh you know curious how this is going to turn out we need a place to make these wines and so uh, we started building a winery in two thousand and and three and and um, finally finished it up in two thousand and six with 2005 being our first finish. Um, and the winery itself is built around this 15 acre vineyard. Um, so that's, that's, that's the vast majority of what we do. Uh, and uh, it's built with taking a lot of inspiration from the right bank of Bordeaux. So um, as we were tasting through estates there, the wines that we really liked were coming, seemed to be coming from these right bank estates and, and most commonly out of these new concrete fermenters uh, or new old concrete fermenters and so um, what we did is we came back here uh, started designing the winery and and realized that we really wanted to have just all poured in place concrete fermenters just like the right bank of Bordeaux uh, and so we we went back over and we got the same masons who helped build Patrice's cellar and Levin Gilles new cellar uh, to come over uh, and spend a few weeks with us getting the geometry of the tanks just right as well as the inside coating since it's just raw concrete. Um, and that was, that was tremendously helpful. Um, so each, you know, each block has its own little, what we call like grape spa uh, in, the, in the winery, um, or a little, you know, grape hot tub, uh, yeah. fermenter. Um, and so there's no, we don't, we have, we can take as much time or as little time as we like during harvest um, making the wine. Um, and then once it tastes just the way we like it, uh, it goes down to, to barrel in our cave. Um, and it's kind of a, a mishmash of, of various coopers, all French oak, kind of about 50% new. And so that's the, that's kind of the, the, the gist of where, where we're, we Very are. Cool, yeah. The one question I wanted to ask you was Pritchard Hill um, is at a relatively high altitude in relation to the rest of Napa, is that right? It is, yeah, absolutely. So, and obviously has a bearing on style. Yeah, uh, we sit at uh, well, it's it's about thirteen hundred feet, um, so twelve hundred feet above the valley floor. So that would be uh, what is that, three hundred meters above the valley oh. floor? I don't know what units everyone's in, but <laughs> you can do a metric or or, or imperial. Um, oh, meters mainly, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're, so we're we sit about uh, 300 meters above the valley floor, and that actually that's a really important point because um, that puts us above the cloud layer or the inversion layer. And so at harvest, we or you know as we get closer to harvest, I'll be down in, in Napa on the valley floor, and I'll wake up and I'll put a coat on because it'll be gray out, and I'll drive up the valley and, and head up the hill, come through the clouds, and it'll be sunny and warm, and then I'll take Incredible. the coat off. Yeah, um, and that's going to have an impact on hydration as well, I would imagine. Uh, you get yeah, a whole so, different microclimate there. Absolutely. What's interesting about that is that the you know the peak daytime temperature for us can be as much as 15 degrees cooler than the valley floor, uh, yeah. and it's a little bit warmer during at night. Um, and then being in the sunshine is is a huge help in terms of uh, really driving that phenolic ripeness and, and getting the tannins to mature exactly the way we want them to on time. So. Cool. All right, so let's have a taste. So cheers, yeah. everybody. Happy Saturday night or Saturday morning, depending where you are. <laughs> so 2016 was a really kind of a spectacular year in Napa um, in a very broad strokes. You know, for us, as I was telling Robert earlier, that each year seems to get better and better, and, that, and that's really driven by that experimentation. Um, so I was saying, I was telling him that last harvest, I don't think there wasn't a single thing that we did the same as the year before. Um, so year, you know, each finish gets, gets better and better, but 16 particularly was a fantastic vintage in the valley. And that was really driven, you know, was towards the end of, of what we call the drought span. So the 2012 to 2017, uh, we had a lot of dry winters um, and we were, we were in a drought and we had slightly, well, just a little bit more rain than the, the previous two years, 
Uh, and kind of more importantly for us, we didn't have quite as much heat in 16. And when we have that, we get it, we get a really nice moderate summer. Um, mm -hmm. It allows, it actually puts the vines kind of in their ideal growing state. And so uh, it was, you know, one of those vintages that as you're tasting the fermentations as they're halfway through, you're just like, oh, well, <laughs> this is working out great. Really I think fantastic. what's amazing, what's amazing for me is, in, in the, for this vintage particularly, is a kind of taunt athleticism. There's a muscularity about the wine, but at the same time, there's vibrant freshness as well. So there's these two kind of um, characteristics that are interplaying really, really well. And so often my experience um, of the big gun Californian Cabernet, especially at an earlier stage like this, is it's just power and there's not a lot of grace going on. And you seem to have captured that um, with, a, with a vibrancy that's really extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, so, um, you know, balance is, is really the, the, the paramount characteristic that's driving everything we're doing during the fermentation and what we're looking at. And, um, we have we have that you know that tension throughout everything that we do it's the tension between the classic you know it's on the front label um, yeah. but it's a, a quote we chose from ovid our namesake um and from one of his poems that was uh and we translated it said partly we um uh recovered the uh, the old familiar things and partly we created something wondrous and new and so we like to have that tension between a, the classic and the exploration uh, and you know the, the the comforting the known what's comfortable and the unknown and what what is edgy what's uh, what's what's uncomfortable i like to uh, i sort of fancy in the phenolics that i'm picking up um I, 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 the only way i can describe it is my grandfather had this old box full of nuts and bolts that he constantly used for various things and there's this there's that kind of ferrous iron kind of component that's coming out of the wine in a wondrous way. It's, it's fantastic because it's got a lot of depth and richness about it as opposed to uh, very often you can get that you can get it in a certainly in an aggressive frantic kind of way. You're definitely not the case. It's, it's really warm and great. Is, do you believe that that's an extraction purely from the soil is, or is it a, a main driver of the terroir that's, that's doing that? Um, Pina, that's a great question. It's a little hard to say. Uh, exactly where that comes from. Um, I mean, I think if I could pinpoint it exactly, uh, then, I, then I'd be a yeah. well. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a crazy yeah. New Zealand winemaker who uh, plows iron filings into his soil in pursuit of the ultimate von Romane Burgundy. And I, I'm not sure whether that's A, legal, B, medicinally allowed. <laughs> It certainly creates a, 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 a that's certainly his approach. He's, uh, he wants to. Every, everyone's got an idea for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I think that, but I will say that, you know, I think the, the characteristic that you're talking about, you know, for me, one of those things is that that bright red iron rich soil on a warm summer afternoon, if you pick up a, a, a handful of it, it has a little bit of that Paris character too. Does it? Okay. A little bit of like, and, and I think of our area on Pritchard Hill as being really kind of driven by these bright red fruits. Um, so a lot of like pomegranate and raspberry and uh, boysenberry. And then there's also these darker, you know, notes, uh, uh, particularly from Cabernet of, of that mulberry and cassis and that really kind of drive that core through. And then there's a, the um, bay laurel. We have lots of bay laurel on the property and that's mm -hmm. uh, always a character I find. And then the wild sage as well. So uh, there's always, you know, a lot going on, and, and uh, I should kind of back up and say that we don't, we don't think of, we don't do any single varietal wines other than one, which I will not talk about, um, I promise. Um, and that is uh, really um, because we feel like blends are the most complete expression. So yeah. not only do we yeah. want to have each invitation be complete, but, and, but to have express the kind of most complete picture of of this place, having a blend is is really what we're most interested in. Um, what I wanted to, to ask you is, I, w I was reading somewhere that uh, back in 06, the Ovid was uh, Cabernet Franc dominant. And I know I asked you this question before we got going for real at six o'clock. Um, what drives the decision? I, I, I'm guessing that you just adapt to what's looking best in every year. Um, but certainly in the last 
say decade, it's always been cab dominance as, from what I can see. Yeah. Is that right? And what do you think's driven that? Well, so it's really um, good cabinet. There's a couple of things there. Uh, so the 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 2006 Ovid was it was almost it was 41 percent front and 45 percent cab. Oh, okay. Um, how I remember that, I don't know. Uh, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll run with that for as long as I can because Lord yeah. knows they're going to take that from me. Um, yeah. So the uh, but we the previous year. So we have the Ovid wines and we have these experiment, this experiment, experiment series, which is a one-off idea each and every year. So the previous year, the 2005 experiment, which was our very first, uh, was Cabernet Franc with a hefty dose of Pete And uh, And those were always kind of the stars of the show initially. We were just blown away by the quality of the Franc. Uh, and Petit Perdeau was, was, was lovely as well. And so um, that wine, that first experiment, really gave us the confidence to, to use a pretty good portion of Franc in the Ovid blends. Um, and so in the last, you know, ever since then, the Franc percentage in the Ovid blend tends to be somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent, which is okay. quite unusual for Napa um, and, and almost fairly unusual for where, where we are as well. Okay. Um, one of the questions that I raised earlier with you that I, I'm sure many people will ask is if you took a 10 year view on vintages, what are the ones that you would pick as, as your favorite uh, or of it in particular? Oh man. Um. <laughs> so 12 was great, right? That was probably great for everybody in that room. Yeah, you know, I, so maybe a, a couple of the under the radar vintages. Um, yeah. Uh, 2010, spectacular, absolutely yeah. spectacular, and just now starting to come into its own. And that's really, you know, we, we that balance that we were talking about earlier where you found that there's a grace, there's power and muscularity, but there's a grace to it. Yeah. And that, that's something that we, you know, we have, we don't release a wine we don't think can go at a minimum 30 years. And so... Uh, but the only way to do that is to have some power and muscularity to it, but with, yeah. it's got to be You balanced. need the architecture, yeah. yeah. And so the wines are really delightful on release as, as you guys are tasting, um, but you know, you give them 10 years from release and they're just, they're just uh, phenomenal. I mean, if, yeah. I don't, yeah. if I don't say so myself. Um, <laughs> But it's, you know, the, so, and 2010 was a little bit reticent as a vintage on release, and it's just so, so good. Uh, and that, that, that's actually kind of true for Valley Wide, but particularly for us. 2011, generally considered a, a terrible year in Napa, and it was phenomenal. In fact, we just had the 2011 yesterday for lunch, and it was uh, just absolutely singing. So, um, you know, great sights in, in 2011 produced incredible wines. Um, 12 was a great year across the valley. 13 was a, a, a rock star year for everyone. If you didn't make good, good wine in 13, you should just hang it up, forget it all. <laughs> no yeah. job. Go um, back to law. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, 15 was a small vintage, but generally very good. And 16 Valley White is very good as well. Uh, and, and then 19 most recently. So the, you know, the drought years are actually really, um, that would, again, 12 through 17 uh, are kind of across the board great. It's kind of hard mm -hmm. to find a bad one in there for sure. Um, so where then, you guys are, you're not back in for water? Because that seems that? to be an increasingly big issue in California. Uh, how much time do you have? We'll pivot from <laughs> the board to the whiteboard because this is something that we've done a ton of research on. Um, okay. No, we're, we're not struggling for water, um, but the, our, all our farming practices uh, are, well, completely different from how we were farming it as we were trying to get in the vineyard established. And um, so we are very, very reticent to give the vines any water at all. Uh, in fact, uh, well, this next week, uh, the vines will be getting their first little bit of irrigation, uh, and that's just at the, as the grapes are turning color. And yep. so most commonly, you know, in the old world, the grape vintages, you know, say in Bordeaux, the grape vintages are where you have a, a, a dry, um, 
most of June is, uh, or certainly the latter half of June is dry, July is dry, first half of August is dry, and then you get some rain. Um, and essentially that's what we're doing, is we don't water the vines at all uh, until we're, you know, the grapes have turned color and it's essentially mid-August. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, um, no, we're not struggling for water and we do everything we can in farming practices to make set ourselves up such that we don't need to, to add any water at all. Any questions from the floor? Guys, anybody want to ask anything of, of Austin? And I ask, um, first of all, it's, uh, I'm tasting it. It's, it's, it's really, really nice. And uh, if I would close my eyes and try to forget where I am, I would expect it to be a very good Bordeaux, actually. Not sure from which part, but congratulations. It's wonderful. Uh, what is the alcohol content of this wine this year? Um, yeah, so the alcohol content is, it, you know, it varies between about 14.5 and 14.8. And so we typically just kind of run the 14.8 on the labels. Um, and that's, again, that, that balance piece. Um, so for us, the, you know, most of my time is actually spent in the vineyard. And, the, and the, uh, to be able to get the balance and to get the freshness in that wine, is, it's really important that the fruit's coming in really in pristine condition. So, um, which is to say that the, there isn't any dehydration which would cause the higher alcohols that you might typically associate with California. Um, that, so we're giving the vines water late in the season, right up to harvest, just so that fruit comes in and it's really nice and turgid and, and beautifully intact. Um, so uh, with, as a consequence, kind of that natural sugar plateau that we reach uh, in the vineyard is about 14, ends up being about 14.5%. Uh, to 14.8, somewhere in there. Depends on the vintage. Doesn't, so. feel, doesn't feel that strong actually, but of course it's, a, it's an Napa Valley wine, so it has to be up there, but it doesn't, uh, sometimes there it's a little bit uh, overwhelming, but not this one. Yeah. But Corin, I think that's about balance, right? Uh, even, uh, it's, it's what Austin was, was saying earlier on, the wine's balanced and in sync. It shouldn't give you too many jazz hands and spirit fingers. Yeah, it's um, it, it's the farming piece is really is critical, and and I, I would say that we do do things in a somewhat antithetical way to a lot of a lot of our, our neighbors, um, but the result uh, speaks for itself, really. So. I've got a question in the private chat. Um, what percentage of your wine leaves the USA? Ooh, uh, maybe anyone. <laughs> Actually, Vivian's the person to ask this. <laughs> it's a tiny, tiny amount. Uh, I mean, it's really a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. It's probably only, I would say, not even 2%. So not very much. Oh, okay. Very little. That very view little. behind you, is that the Ovid view? Yes, that's the view from the winery. All right. So that's uh, 1,400 yeah. feet up. That's amazing. Yeah. There you go. You can see it when I take that. Yeah, it's pretty thanks for that. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Problem. I reckon that fireplace has seen a bit of action over time. <laughs> yes, it's it's absolutely stunning up there. It is it's it's breathtakingly beautiful, actually. I had somebody who's asked uh, if it's possible next year, God willing, and uh, that they can actually come back to the to California if they can pay a visit. So I said I'd put you in touch with them next year and try and figure something out. I know you guys don't take a lot of businesses at the winery, but um, I'll let you know. I'll let them know about that, I guess. Yeah, please do. Yeah, it's, um, we're a small place and a, and a small team, but we're, we're always happy to share the, the, the space and the wines and always happy to have visitors up here, so. Thank you so much. Anybody else before we wrap it up and let the guys go back to bed? Uh, just a quick one. Um, yeah. Austin, I know in the not too distant past, Napa's had some trouble with uh, brush fires, wildfires, etc. Has that reached up to Pritchard Hill? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Robert. The, um, we've been really lucky in that. So part of the farming practices is to actually help advance the timing of, of harvest. Um, so we, we, we lucked out and we uh, we're spared in 17. We had all our fruit in. 
uh, and that was kind of the one that was most close to home. Um, it's certainly a concern every year. We, you know, we're worried. We're always worried about um, if and when a fire is going to start. Uh, so, um, th you know, that said, we we uh, are kind of doing our best to ensure that we have all contingencies in place, such that should a fire start, either everything's harvested already, or um, or we can do that before the smoke arrives, or you know, if it's if it starts earlier in the season, we're just not going to make wine that year, basically. So, um, so there's you know, as an industry, that's definitely a real concern, and there's a lot of um, uh, conversations happening about what we can do to really ensure that that's not a problem for us. Um, but by and large, we've been fortunate in the last handful of years that the vast majority in Napa Valley, the vast majority of fruit has been harvested prior to the, to the um, fires. Um, and when they do arrive, you know, we're really take, taking advantage of new technologies. And now that, I, I, now that it's occurring to me in my 3, 3 a.m. brain, um, the new technologies are really actually one of the most kind of fascinating and, and game-changing pieces for that. So. You know, we've changed our our sorting line um, at the winery such that we could process our entire vintage in a day if we really had to. Um, and so, you know, if it came to that, we could save the vintage that way. And we've retrofitted all our tanks such that they they pump themselves over, and we can just set that on a cycle, and it will do that for us. Uh, so that if we can't make it to the winery, the generator will run the winery, and the, the tanks will essentially run themselves, and we can log in and, and see how that's progressing and, and make our adjustments. Um, obviously, it's not how we prefer to do it, um, but uh, we've kind of set ourselves up such that there's there's plan A, B, and C um, should disaster strike. So f fingers crossed that, um, yeah. that we don't yeah, again. Well, fingers crossed you guys can come and visit us in Singapore sooner rather than later, and I'm sure we can uh, find some traditional Singapore food to match this Ovid somewhere. <laughs> There's a few options that are springing to mind. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, we need the crab. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Maybe the white pepper crab rather than the... The white pepper the crab, food. yes. Yeah, I'm thinking that would be pal. delicious. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. And um, I really appreciate it and hope we see you next vintage. Thanks so Thank much, you, Austin Robert. Olivia. Thank you, okay. Austin, so much for getting up. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Yes. Thanks See you very all. Much. And Thanks. do come Bye. and visit us. Please come and For visit us. Sure. We'll <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Where right. you can. Thank you. Good Bye. night. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, Austin. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, such a nice one. Thanks, everybody. I'll be in touch. Uh, what are we doing next week? Oh, the Grange. Gosh, huge event. So I've oh, yes, all and all that. Be, be prepared for that as well. Yeah. It's taken quite a lot of organizing. We've got 36 people and, you know, getting it delivered on time in the right condition. So anyway, it's, it's all sorts. Uh, I forgot to return your bottles to the delivery. Oh, don't please. worry. Um, send it to the next batch and we'll, we'll credit you. No problem. <laughs> okay, cheers, everyone. All right, thanks, sir. Have a good weekend. Take it easy. Good night, everybody. Bye.